I'm continuing the concept of sharpening our edge. And uh, I just, just think that through, it's not through backsliding or living unclean lives. It's just through hard work that our knives get blunt. Uh, and there's another similar imaging to this is a candle or the lamps. The wick would burn, but occasionally you need to trim the wick. Otherwise, the, the flame burned low and you got a lot of smoke. And so that is, you're getting half the luminance and brightness and buoyancy and light giving power of the lamp, plus you're getting annoying off of, uh, offside effects and, and just to trim up every now and then. And so I want to talk about, continue here, about sharpening our edge and trimming that wick so that we're burning clean and bright. And the area that I, I really want to move into here to become these life-giving churches within reach of every Australian, to move into how we can sharpen our edge in the Spirit. So 2 Corinthians 3, 6 says, God has made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. And we can turn the New Testament into a law and, and it, it, it kills people. We, we can use it. I know somebody in our LA church who went to a particular congregation, which is for, for, for some reason called Grace something else, you know, church. And, and they came away from there traumatised. They needed counselling, all sorts of stuff, because they were just told, they were going to hell, you, you're not really saved, your salvation is insecure. If you got saved there, it's not real salvation, you know, you got to get... And they, they thought they were. And they went there to find more of God and it, this, this place sort of says, we can take you deeper and all that kind of thing. But uh, he found people in the car park were pounding him with, with scriptures and just a whole legalistic thing. New Testament stuff. But it killed him. Didn't give life. So if you just take the letter, the written words of the New Testament, it'll kill you. There's a spirit behind those letters of Paul, and you need to grasp that. You and I need to grasp the Holy Spirit. I'm right into the Bible, but I wonder sometimes if there's such a thing as bibliolatry, <laughs> where <clears throat> it's, I'm right into Scripture. D don't misread me here. But in the New Testament, they didn't have a... New Testament. They only had the Holy Spirit and the teaching of the apostles who'd been with Jesus and a bunch of Old Testament scriptures that they were drawing affirmation out of and confirmation of current events. So in the New Testament, you gotta, we've got to realise we are ministers of the Spirit. We are called to bring God into church. You're a minister of the Spirit because the Spirit gives life. So when Lars says we want to be life-giving churches, we're not going to be unless we're bringing the Holy Spirit. It is life-giving. The Holy Spirit is the life-giving power of God. And the contrast is astonishing between Mount Sinai, Moses descending with two tablets of stone and in judgment on the backsliding Israelites, 3,000 people die. It is not a coincidence that on the day of Pentecost, the same as 50 days after the Passover lamb, Sinai was 50 days after the Passover lamb, on the same day, sovereignly out of heaven on God's calendar, His diary book, oh, we send the Spirit today. Bam, down comes the Holy Spirit it is not a coincidence that the Bible records 3,000 people came alive. That is the difference between the ministry of the letter and the ministry of the Spirit. And you and I, yeah, go ahead, give the Lord a clap offering. See, I told you I'm preaching, you know, it's like a, a message thing. <laughs> Devotions you don't clap in, you know, it's just, the, just rustle papers. Yeah. So, so, so. Bringing God to your church 
means you need a sharp edge. You, because a sharp edge can hear God, but a dull edge just thinks in its own brain. Thinks, oh, let's do this. Oh, here's the run sheet, that. But a sharp edge discerns the voice. And, and as soon as, uh, was it, you talking about discouragement last night? To the bone? Those words were right from the Holy Spirit. You could hear it. It just would ring. And, uh, and you, you can hear the word of the Lord if it's in a person's mouth and it's sharp and it cuts and it's effective. And we bring the Spirit when we are effectively listening to and seeing what we're meant to be doing as a minister of the Spirit. He's not submitted to us. We are meant to be submitted to Him. And when He's Lord and ruling our lives, we're going to find ourselves moving in power. Never get too impressed with yourself. That donkey would have been very mistaken if he thought the crowd was cheering him when there was Jesus on his back. <laughs> and we are meant to be carrying Jesus into the meeting. <laughs> the old donkey. Whoa, yeah, I'm pretty good. You ass. <laughs> to Samuel 6, 1. And, and I went through this yesterday, but I'm just going to recap super quick. David gathered all the choice men of Israel, 30,000. So you can get all your choice men, women, musicians and everything and think, God, I'm honouring you with the best people I've got here. These are army, these are military guys. And then I've got the new cart. And I've got a couple of cows. He's bringing up these guys. And we know the story. And I, I mentioned it yesterday. It gets stuck out Obed-Edom's house. The story of Obed-Edom is incredible. Because it's there for three months. In three months, the presence of God in a Philistine's, a, a foreigner's house converts every one of them. And from then on, when that ark went back to Jerusalem, Obed-Edom, he packed up. He said, I'm not, I'm not leaving this. This is awesome. He fell in love with the presence. The outcomes were amazing. His, his whole farm was getting blessed. His income tripled, doubled, whatever, ten, tenfold. But he loved the feeling of the presence of God. So he took his whole family up. Now, when you read, we haven't got time to go through David setting up the temple. Okay, he's saying, okay, we need some gatekeepers. Who will be a gatekeeper? And says, Obed-Edom and his sons said, yeah, we want to be the gatekeepers. Then it says, we need some choir members. Who's going to be choir singing around? Obed-Edom and his sons put up their hand. Yeah, we want to be in. We may need people for the treasury. Who's going to do that? Obed-Edom's got his hand up. He becomes a volunteer for every position you can find in David's tabernacle, in David's temple. And so what I'm saying to you is, number one, he got converted. Number two, he sacrificed all of the worldly stuff for the presence of God. He became a consecrated, devoted follower and he was there to minister in the house of God because of the presence of the Lord. We would be better to spend four hours sharpening our axe, getting the presence of God there than pounding the pulpit saying, we need volunteers, give your money, consecrate yourselves. If we brought His presence it will melt the hearts and, and it will bring power. Now, David discovered that you can't carry the presence of God, no matter how flash your cart is. You could have a Lamborghini cart and it ain't going to make any difference to God. You could have you know, all of your bodybuilders from Venice Beach, Karen, you know, like that, that being, being there to just guide the ark and guide the animals and that, it, it's not going to impress God. 
He wants people who are set apart to Him. And we need to understand His presence is carried on the shoulders of people. And this gets really important all through your church because some of you have sent people off to Bible college or they're doing a course and we imagine that that qualifies them. But it doesn't. You and I as leaders have to have the courage to appoint into position the people that God shows us. This is the person for that. And it always means that this person is not. And that person we risk offending because we're appointing the people that God is putting into position. But that's the courage of a leader. That's where you need to be able to protect that. Because uh, my experience is that when you get a person who is called by God and is carrying the presence into that area of the church, and for us, you know, one of the most significant areas in the early days was establishing new believers because we were getting so many people saved, hundreds and hundreds. And we needed somebody who, and I could, I could do it. We, we, we found if we had a couple meals with the family, within, within a short period of time, they'd get established. I found if I, uh, generally, if I shook their hands at the door, learned their name, they'd be back next week. Uh, also, I found if I had a word of knowledge or prophecy about somebody in the foyer, that that really secured people in the house of God. Not that I tried to you know, artificially manufacture them, but I just find that if I had something from God for them, I'd bring it to them. And I was carrying God into our new members, but I couldn't cover them all. So we had a guy in there uh, who's, who was incredible. His name was Neil. And uh, he, he had a 75% retention rate for, our con- for, for people getting saved. It was unbelievable. We'd never seen anything like that. It normally was around about 25, 30 But he got in there and he was anointed for it. Now he said to me, because he went off to, we were so much into church planning, we were sending everybody everywhere. And and he said, I feel like I should be going with this particular church plan. And I'm going, oh, I don't know about that. I don't want to lose you. A person like you is rare. I don't know anybody else in our place who, who does what you do. He said, don't worry, I've got systems in place. As soon as, as, soon as uh, the person gets saved, within 24 hours, they're going to get a phone call. Somebody's going to visit them. They'll get a letter, blah, blah, all this kind of thing. They'll be invited into it. We went down to 25% again, just like that. Systems don't carry presence. I'm saying to you, God is carried into your church on the shoulders of your people. Your people are the key all the time. The, the, the worship leader is the key for bringing people into the presence of God. It doesn't matter about the song they're singing or the lights or anything else. If they have touched God, God will come into that room. Okay, so David got the ark back into Jerusalem, stuck it on Mount Zion or Mount Jebus, Pull back the flaps of an old army tent and the glory of God shone out over Israel and all Israel prospered. So in the New Testament, in Acts 15, 16, God says, after this I will return, quoting Amos 9, 11, and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. Even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does all these things. So God says the secret to bringing this world to Christ is the rebuilding of the tabernacle of David, for goodness sake. Not Solomon's, not Noah's altar, not Jacob's pillar, not Abraham's altar, not Ezekiel's temple, not Herod's temple, not Moses' tabernacle in the wilderness. You think that with the power... the, the pillar of fire and the cloud over it. Do you think that would be worth getting? No, it was David's simple temple, tabernacle, tent. He said, I want that. God said, I want that. I, I want a simple, pull back the flaps, shine out. But, but then Solomon came along and, and stuck him in the back room again. Like Moses had him in the back room, in that Holy of Holies place. You couldn't even get in there. There was no doorway. into. It's just a curtain. So God got sick of it. 
He was, he was stuck down that back room for centuries. Finally, his son's there. He dies. God said, I'm getting out of here. And he rips the thing. <laughs> he's gone, baby. He's down, on, he's down on Acts 2, falling down on people. He says, I love it out here on the streets. I love it out here with the people. Don't stick me in some back room. Put me in, in your church services. Put me in your people. Okay, I'm going to finish. I'm a bit over, one minute over. All right. Just the, the way that I would sharpen my spirit so that I can see and hear and know the voice of God and what He is saying to me is speaking in tongues. It is your dial for tuning in to that radio signal, that frequency. And speaking in tongues unhooks your brain from your tongue and hooks your spirit to your tongue. And and so out of that, you are being spirit motivated and your brain is articulating the spiritual fumes, if you like, or uh, scent that is arising from your inner man rather than your brain being your master. Your spirit becomes your ruler because you don't know what you're saying. You're speaking in mysteries. And the fascinating thing is on the day of Pentecost, those guys spoke in tongues and they started reaching the most difficult crowd you could ever think of to reach the presence of God traveling through them to convert very hard hearts. People's hearts are slippery as eels in a bucket of oil. And to, to, <laughs> to spear them, you need the Holy Spirit. You need, you, your human hand can't do it. Your logic won't do it. People aren't converted by that. They're converted by a sharp spirit. Your spirit sharpened in the presence of God, acting like a scalpel, severing sin out of their life and setting them free. Let's all stand in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray that Your Spirit will fall on our lives here in this conference, that we would become sharp in the power of the Spirit, moving in the Spirit of God, hearing from God, moving in the anointing, bringing Your grace to bear on hard hearts, people afar off from God, people in delusion, People in deception, Father, will find truth and mercy so that all the rest of mankind might seek the Lord as we rebuild a tabernacle of praise, worship, and the glory of God. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. Thank you.